Okay, we're back. It's a Wednesday. We're doing Trump Week on a Wednesday. That's Tim Apicello over there, my co-host on Trump Week. Every week on Wednesday, one of the most important shows Wednesday. we do in our lineup, 11 o'clock on Wednesday. So we look at what's going on with Trump and uh, figure out what kind of crazy things he's done this week and try to connect the dots with last week and next week. And uh, this week has really been chock-a-block. Uh, I guess, you know, why, why do we care so much? Why do you care so much what he does? Well, first off, Cynthia's not here, and I know she cares, and she's, I, she, she deeply regrets not being here today. Why do I care? Because this is my country. This is the reputation of Americans. And what's transpiring here in the last couple of weeks alone is enough to have us go look ourselves in the mirror and say, who are we as Americans? And that brings me to the first topic, and that is the announcement that Turkey can come in into Syria. And in the unilateral decision by Donald Trump himself, and this certainly means that the Kurds, who have been our, our allies for years and years and years, who have fought 95% of the wars against ISIS, and we're going to stab them in the back and give Turkey a green light to just bomb the hell out of them? We did stab them in the we back. We just did. They're bombing them right so now the, as we the speak. The world knows exactly what we did, and the world is now going to see the result of what we did. I feel great shame as an American that this is occurring right now, today. A great shame that we do this to an ally. And what does America stand for, if nothing else, than to stand by our allies that we have for, for, for over 150 years we stand by our allies? Who could trust us now? Who could trust us? Yeah. And, and, and what is the implication on NATO on this? A huge implication. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, um, this puts Erdogan and Turkey closer to Russia and further from NATO. He doesn't care about NATO. Well, not only that, but this is a you know this is an open invitation for now Iran, Syria, Russia. Um, look, the Kurds are gonna they're gonna have to side with somebody, and if they can't depend on the United States, um, they're gonna have to go to God forbid Iran, and, and you know seek protection under their flag yeah. or or Syria. Why did he do this? You know, we predicted last week, just a week ago, that he would do something to change to do a change up. You know, a distraction. We did. It wasn't. And and I I thought maybe he would do something with Syria. I was right. That's what happened. But what was bizarre about it is this telephone call, and it reveals that he has these telephone calls with national leaders around the world that are bizarre, that are that are not you know part of the script. They come off the wall, and he had a telephone call with uh, with Erdogan where it changed his mind and it changed national policy, geopolitical positioning, all in one call, complete 180, and now he's dumping on the Kurds, and he's, uh, I guess, I'm not sure what he's doing, befriending Erdogan, which I don't think that's a good relationship there anyway. Uh, so, you know, that, that is bizarre in itself, that without any advice, without, the, with, without consulting right. the military, um, he doesn't have a secretary of state because, because uh, Pompeo is, is merely a yes man and he doesn't have any, he doesn't push back, he doesn't collaborate in the thought process, he just does what Trump tells him. So, um, you know, he did this by himself, as you said. How can we have in international global policies, foreign policies, where one guy runs it and he's ignorant? How can we have that? We can't. This is chaos. Chaos in the making. Um, you said it several times in the previous shows, this is a sole proprietorship of leadership for the United States. We cannot continue to operate like this. And we've got to somehow reverse the damage that's been done, particularly, and, and help the Kurds as best we can. And, and they're being bombed right now. Um, Turkish planes are bombing Kurd positions. And this is how we treat our, our, our comrades in arm that have been on the, on the, on the fighting, fighting lines for years and years and years. This is how we treat them. This reminds me very much similar to what happened when we were in Iran and we had a situation when Donald Trump came in the office and he, you know, he had that Muslim ban and we had interpreters in Iran that were under death threats in Iran and they wanted to seek asylum here in the United States and Trump said no. These are our comrades. These are the guys who risked their lives. They risked their lives, their families' lives, their, you know, the whole generation of lives because that's the retribution that they can expect. Who would trust us? Nobody. What do we stand for if you can't trust the United States of America? Yeah. Well, I mean, we, you can't. Sorry. You know, this is the, another major blow to our trustworthiness, and he's done it. And what's, what's worse is that he, he probably didn't know exactly what the relationship with the Kurds 
was in the past? That's not true. That's not true. Oh, really? September 28th, 2018, Donald yes. Trump is quoted to say, all the things Kurds, the Kurds have done for us, they're great people. So he acknowledged that they've done things for us, at least. And now he turns on them. He, because of one time. He turned on them. He stabbed them in the back. Yeah. I'm, as you could tell, I'm not happy no, no, about this. I'm that. pretty upset. Well, I mean, the result of this, it's not only you know, we lose credibility around the world. The result is that it'll, it'll, uh, it'll, it'll throw the Middle East into much more, uh, much more pandemonium. And um, the, the, this, is, this is like pulling the keystone out of the arch. Everything is going to fall down now. Uh, they always say that, you know, Turkey is the, um, you know, however you want to interpret this, is, is an important, it's a capstone, one guy said, uh, of the Middle East. Very it important. is kind of a Western influence in, in Turkey, and it's the joining of the East and the West and all that. It's a big country, all, um, and it has a, you know, big history. It has uh, the ability to stick around for a long time. Well, they, they have a long history with long the history. interaction with the United States, yeah. and they also have a long history of uh, genocide against the Armenians and could be potentially now against the Kurds. So as Turkey goes, so goes the Middle East. And, uh, and of course, as the U.S.'s position in the Middle East goes, so goes the Middle East. I'm very worried about what, what yeah. Trump has done. He's, he, we don't have to dwell on the other moves he's made in the Middle East, but he's certainly wrecked our relationships and... I think he's done enough, including especially this last maneuver, um, to bring the Middle East into a, a new kind of conflagration. Yeah. So that, I, I, I don't have a problem with the, the statement that, you know, he said he was elected as a president to get out of our, our wars and, you know, all the trillions of dollars we spent. I don't have an issue with some of that, but I have an issue in the way he's doing it, you know, laterally. Yeah, what did he have, and, 100 troops in Syria? That's yeah, all. Yeah. That's all. And, and so getting but, out of our, pulling 100 troops out, it doesn't mean much. I'm yeah. sorry. But it's the green light for Turkey to come in and do what they please. Yeah. That's, that's the biggest issue is the green light saying, go ahead. And, yeah. you know, he, he made some kind of um, comment about um, Turkey and Boston. Basically, he said, if Turkey does anything, that was three days ago, if Turkey does anything, in my unmatched wisdom, Remember that Remember unmatched that wisdom. That, yeah. I will wreak havoc. Stable genius. I will wreak, you know, wreak havoc on their economy. And well, guess what? Three days later, I, I don't think they care. Well, Erdogan responded to that. He said, "We'll do what we want." He's not going to tell us what to do. It didn't befriend Erdogan that he that he said that. It was a threat on Erdogan. Well, this the background of that was Erdogan wanted to meet him in New York, and uh, Trump snubbed him, didn't meet with him, and so uh, that made him very unhappy. And this is some way of trying to, you know, to smooth, smooth that out and say, oh, go ahead, you do what you wish with the Kurds, do what you wish now if you want to come into Syria because you were, you were snubbed in New York. Really? It's all, it's all backward. And it's, it's all crazy. And it's not getting us anywhere. It's hurting us. It's hurting us in, in, in fact and in, in image. But uh, let's move on because yeah. I, mean, I continue to feel that what he did was a distraction from his impeachment problems. This man is being impeached. Right. Um, and I think the most, the thing that sticks in my brain is that eight-page letter that his uh, kaleidoscopic White House, I say kaleidoscopic White House because every time you look, there's new people there um, advising him. They wrote, wrote this stinko letter saying, I'm not going to cooperate with any of you guys because it's not a legitimate investigation. How dare he do that? You know, you Congress guys, you, you House of Representatives guys, you're not legitimate. You can't do anything. I'm ignoring you. That's, that's, now, one writer I saw said, well, it's not quite a constitutional crisis. I think it's a constitutional crisis. There's a, you know, that thin little dividing line. Uh, the constitutional crisis would be, uh, would be pushed forward if he overtly avoids a Supreme Court decision or ruling. Mm, I saw that in the article. But, you know, ignoring the Congress, ignoring the subpoenas, not, not responding, not providing documents, nothing, building a wall around the well, White it's House. Article 3 that, under the, the Richard a, Nixon that's a impeachment. That's constitutional crisis. It's that's worse than Nixon's. That was our, Article 3, his obstruction. Yeah. I mean, talk about just checking the, the check boxes for obstruction yeah. and a rationale for a vote for impeachment. So Frank Bruni, the New York Times, uh, I get his newsletter because yeah. I like him. And, and uh, he was saying, you know, isn't it enough? Why don't they just go to a vote already? They, they should not distract the, the, the Congress, uh, the House, uh, the, the Democrats in the House. Why are they expanding, you know, the investigation that's not going to pay off 
they already have what they need. need. We said that they last week. Go for it. Yeah. Don't waste time. Because time works in Trump's favor. favor. Yeah. yeah. That's that's what I said last week. And in here again, keep getting more information, more information and in, in, in making it more complex that the American public won't understand this. Right. Confusion. That's what that's what Frank Bruni said. Yeah. And so I think, you know, I don't think that Nancy Pelosi fully understands this. I don't think Schiff fully understands this. They've got to move on it. The, the public, you and me and all our friends, they're ready for this. Um, and, and we should just move to impeachment yeah. proceedings. I, uh, I did listen to Ed and Case. And this obstruction is part of it. Yeah. Know? I listened to a representative Ed Case for two hours. He had a telephone townhouse, um, town square meeting. And he was a Johnny come lately on this, you know, throwing his hat in on the, the impeachment inquiry. Mm -hmm. And he said, there's three things that we have to verify. One, did Trump ask Ukraine to interfere in our, our upcoming election and the quid pro quo? Two, did he withhold money from Ukraine as far as their military assistance? If that can be proven, the answer is yes, it can be. And last but not least, but... Um, did he interfere with the lawful whistleblowing process? For sure. For sure. So those three things, you know, that's what he wants to see out of this Number four, inquiry. is he interfering with Congress's process? Yeah. That's, that's, it, what, so to what degree is the, the obstruction? So the bottom line is, um, you know, someone who was reluctant, and his rationale for not uh, voting for an impeachment earlier was that he didn't want to see both Republican and Democrats um, Whatever the president, whoever the president is elected, he didn't want to see impeachment being used as the arsenal because they don't like style or, or political decisions. They didn't want to see the impeachment process being implemented. I understand that, but these are clear cases. And with Mueller, uh, ten article, you know, ten points of obstruction. Um, these are valid reasons for an impeachment inquiry, and certainly for an impeachment vote. I don't know if I fully agree with him, but he ha he needs to defend his delay. That's why he's coming up with these reasons to justify his delay. But the reality, you and I have talked about it. We should run for office. The you reality, first. You first. <laughs> <laughs> not these days. Um, is, is that, um, you know, this should have happened a long time ago. We're not talking about style here. We're, talking about, we're not talking about policy. We're talking about the Mad Hatter. Yeah. You know, who every, everything he does is crazier than the last thing. And we're going into new normal. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what's happening now about, uh, you know, uh, ignoring, ignoring uh, Congress is just outrageous. Let's take a short break, Tim. We'll come back. There's much more. We could never finish these shows. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Mufi Hadamid. I want to tell you about a great show that appears on Think Tech Hawaii. It's all about tourism. In fact, we call it Tourism 101, where we talk about the issues and challenges that faces our number one industry throughout the state. We'll have some interesting guests, some very informative dialogue, and allow you an opportunity to maybe learn a little bit more about why this industry is so important for our state. It's been great for us in the past. We need it today, and especially going forward. That's Tourism 101 on Think Tech Hawaii. Mahalo. Aloha. My name is Victoria, and I'm a host at the Adventures in Small Business. This is a collaboration between U.S. Small Business Administration, Hawaii District Office, and its partners, where we showcase the stories of local entrepreneurs and small businesses, talk about how to start a business, talk about great tips for small business owners. Uh, please join us every Thursday, 11 a.m. at Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, see you soon. Mahalo. Yes, we're back. We're back on Trump week, and we have much. We have miles to go. Um, okay, let's let's go to the uh, the judge in the uh, let's see the district court in New York. I think this is Southern District of New York ru ruled against him. He filed an action in that court in the federal court to try to stop um, tax returns. Yeah, Cyrus Vance, who is the who is the district attorney for Manhattan, to get uh, Trump's tax returns. Cyrus tried. Uh, the, the district court agreed, and uh, I mean, with re re requiring the release of the tax returns, major decision, and it's that opinion that was so interesting. And he laid it out the way I would have laid it out. I mean, this is protecting our democracy. The president is not above the law. There is no good reason whatsoever uh, to exempt him from this process or from criminal investigation. 
Well, again, you know, Trump, you know, the Trump saying, well, you know, I can't be a, a, a indicted because I'm a sitting president. Well, that's never been a Supreme Court ruling. It was an opinion in the DOJ. Um, so the judge took issue to that. And, and, you know, here we have the president in the White House saying, well, not only are we not uh, subject to indictment, but also now we're not subject to impeachment. And, you know, the judge took issue with this. Yeah. So what are you? I mean, basically, you have self-declared yourself king of, a, of the United that's where, States. That's where he's been going. And if you connect the dots with our little show over here, Trump Week, that's what you find. And, and the really troubling thing is that people seem to accept this. It, ha it has a ring about it. It has a familiarity about it. He wants to be king. He wants to be a dictator. He doesn't want to be troubled by the Constitution. I think we're in a constitutional crisis because he's going to keep on doing that. Which takes me to one sidebar point. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to figure it out. I've been talking to people, trying to get their, you know, their thoughts on it. Why does the base support this craziness? Doesn't the base know this is, this is a stress and strain and a breach of, of the United States Constitution of everything this country stands for? Why do they support him? Support him, give him money. You know, he's got almost a billion dollars in the till. And it increased. Every time he gets to, you know, he does one of these really wild things, he gets more money. Why do they support him? Do you have a theory? I have theories only. Um, this theory may be similar to Richard Nixon when he was being impeached. Uh, they were going through the, the process, and he maintained a strong 38%. Well, it's not strong, but he maintained 38%. Why wasn't those numbers lower? Um, Donald Trump has a cult of personality. And, you know, I'm getting to the point where I'm going to start saying the cult of personality is similar to Jim Jones. I mean, yes. if, if, if he says, drink the Kool-Aid, boys and girls, um, do as I say, it's I, I'm not sure that they wouldn't do it. Oh, I agree with you. you shoot know, this somebody is, on Fifth Avenue and get away with it. Yeah. You, know, these are, you know, these are extreme things for me to have to say. But at this point, there's a certain percentage of this country, they know that he's, you know, he's trying to basically break the Constitution, he's trying to be above the rule of law, and they don't care. Now, your question is why? Well, I think they just like him, they like the cult of personality. I think that Donald Trump appeals to their inner, if you will, racist uh, tendencies. Um, he's trying to make America great again. Well, what does that mean? You know, nostalgia for nostalgia for, some, for no rights for, for women, no path. rights for you know gay, lesbian, uh, no rights for you know minorities. Um, you know, tight immigration. Uh, I don't mind these tight immigration issues, but this is not the best and the best that America can do. Well, he, you know, I had a conversation with somebody this morning about this and his view of it. And I guess I would have to agree is that there's not one thread only. <clears throat> Maybe the, <clears throat> the, the underlying feature that brings them together is the cult of personality, as you say, the Jim Jones effect. Um, but I think there's probably a lot of reasons that people jump on that bandwagon. Some of it is, is racist. Some of it is bigotry and hatred. Uh, some of it is um, uh, they, they want to protect the... Uh, jobs for white America, you know, their jobs, yeah. and they think that, uh, you know, Hispanic crossing the border uh, jeopardizes their jobs. Uh, some of them, you know, are just very unhappy. They're unhappy with the federal government. Uh, they'd like to blow up the uh, federal building in Oklahoma City. Uh, you know, they're just angry with the federal government and they don't want any part of it. What's harder to understand is the rich guys uh, with the education, um, you know, th and they may, they may turn ultimately um, the, the ones who are paying less taxes, they're really happy with that. The ones who are involved in this high-level corporate management, they may be happy with Trump because he's saving them some money and making them look good. Um, but, you know, I don't think they're going to stick with this in yeah. the long term. Bottom line, though, is that I think there's a lot of elements, a lot of factors and sectors all bunched up under a personality cult where he doubles down on everything where he criticizes people, where he gives you schadenfreude, the enjoyment of mm -hmm. seeing other people's misfortune. And, and that somehow uh, acts as a common denominator. Yeah. I guess I want to differentiate between those that are, you know, regardless of what he says or does, they're loyal. They'll never question his, his words or his actions. Um, there are people who are going to vote for Donald Trump that did vote for Donald Trump that are doing it based on policies, things they want to see. I, I'm thinking of the, you know, the evangelical Christians that think, 
okay, he's there to get the Supreme Court you know, to a Roe point v. where v. they're going to reverse Roe v. Wade, yes. There are those that say, you know, he look at my stock portfolio, it's better than ever. There are those that say, you know, I, am, I like him because he is tough on immigration. Those are policy reasons. I don't have an issue with that. I don't like the way he's implementing those policy, you know, um, strategies. But I'm separating those folks from the, those that are just, no matter what he says or does, it's okay with me, no matter how horrific. Um, putting kids in cages. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, he's okay with us, and we, we like Trump. And we'll stick with him no matter what he does. Well, I think it's a whole combination of things. They all have their own reasons, um, but they all come together. And if you talk to them, they will have a defense. They will have, you know, one guy I talked to, he said, he said um, you know, would you rather Hillary Clinton be president? Thinking that, you know, I, I'm one of those people who hate Hillary Clinton so much, I would vote for Trump instead? I said, no. no. I'd like to have Hillary. I'd like to have anybody but Trump. Yeah. Anyway, let's just, it's, just well, a, let's, it's an explanation, a discussion we have to have moving forward. Let's go to another well, Let's go to talk about the split in the GOP, because this, this, tags, this sure. tags right onto this topic yeah. that we were just discussing. Yeah, and, yeah. and they are starting to split off. They're starting to split off. Now, a lot of them aren't necessarily saying, you know, this is wrong, but they're starting to ask the questions. Lamar Alexander of Tennessee, I want to know the facts. He's talking about the impeachment inquiry. And um, Mike Crapo from I Idaho, I want to wait for further information for facts of this matter, okay? Rob Portman, I should have not erased the Biden issue on that call, period. Um, Mitt Romney, we know what Mitt Romney has said. Uh, John Thume, I'm not a fan of um, cases about the president and how he goes about this. So here we have some cracks in the veneer and rather serious cracks. Now you take that, then you couple it up with the other Republicans about the, um, you know, the, the Turkey coming across the border and, and putting the Kurds in, in jeopardy. You have Lindsey Graham and a whole bunch of others. So these are serious cracks yeah. and now. And the Senate report that just came out about Russia, about how Russia was more actively involved in screwing up our election in 2016. Yeah, that report that's, just that, came out. Yeah, that's out of the Senate. Yeah, that's, that's a Senate Republican report. Senate, yeah. That's a bipartisan Senate report. Yeah. Um, so of the, of the Republicans in the Senate, uh, zero support impeachment inquiry at this point. Now, 14 of them say they have concerns or serious questions about what occurred, mm. okay? Mm -hmm. And then 39 support Trump unequivocally, okay? That's the Senate. Those numbers are going to change. Oh, yeah, because he's not going to get any better. I got to say, though, that last week, just to connect the dots, people were saying uh, when the uh, you know, impeachment thing began, and he was making these outrageous statements and, and calling for help from China and all this. People were saying, uh, you know, he doesn't have a defense. He doesn't have a team. He doesn't have a strategy to deal with the impeachment. Okay, well, he heard that, and now he has a strategy. It's distraction, deception, uh, and it's that eight-page letter saying, I'm not going to cooperate. Well, it's name-calling. Name-calling, right. And you're all, you're all uh, traitors. You're all no traitors. traitors. All of you, you yep. know, should all be removed. But, you know, I, I don't think that helps him. I don't think it helps him in the Senate. Um, because it, it's bad karma and it's bad precedent for the way government should work. But the other thing is, uh, the other thing is that the polls, the country, because the Senate is somewhat, you know, I hope, mm -hmm. the Senate is somewhat responsive to the public opinion in the country, and the polls are changing. They're shifting. Can you talk about it? Yeah, I will. I guess I just want to make one quick comment before I hit these numbers, is it's not so much the, the, the veracity of them coming out against Trump, it's the silence of them not supporting Trump. And I think that's a really critical point. Talking about the Senate, the Republicans. Yes, yes. They're not really out there saying, you know. Oh, well, what can you say to What can you say? The ones who have supported him have come up with the same kind of cockamamie arguments that he's come up with. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, quid pro quo. Give me a break. It's there in English, the well, quid pro quo. Yeah. And, and they still, there's some of them that still say that. It's like a lie in public. You know, it's like walking around in a lie. Okay, anyway, talk about the polls. Well, let's talk numbers, because these are, these are shifting numbers. Now, if you remember, just as the story broke about this Ukraine phone call, we had 37% saying that there should be any kind of mention of, of, of impeachment inquiry. 37%. Well, those numbers have changed. Washington, uh, the Washington Post poll, 58% in support of um, an inquiry. Uh, NBC, 55%. Quinnipiac, 53%. Uh, now, those numbers are up. <laughs> and um, of that, of those three things, 18% um, of the Republicans on the Washington Post said, yeah, let's, let's, let's 
let's look at this inquiry. Um, on the NBC, 11% of Republicans, and the Quinnipiac was uh, 6%. So of, let's see, out of seven different pollsters, um, five of them were over 50%. NBC, 55%, Washington, uh, Washington Post was 58%, uh, CBS, 55%. So five out of seven were over the 50% percentile. That's, that's, a, that's a shift. That's a movement. It's not a movement, but it's a shift. You know, you know what that tells me, though, just in a way? Like Washington Post, of all of those media, is the most uh, aggressive in terms of stories against Trump and the way they characterize things. And lo and behold, they have the highest percentage yeah. of people who want the inquiry, want the impeachment. And, and I say to myself, you know, there's something to be drawn from that. Um, that's the Washington Post community. The Washington Post is aggressively against Trump, and it gets feedback in its polls that are more aggressively against Trump, and so forth for the other ones. Um, and it's, it's just, uh, it strikes me that there are, there are communities around, there are phenomena that are happening that we don't fully yet understand about how people react on a sort of mass psychology basis to the messaging that is given them. There was some guy testifying in front of uh, Ted Cruz. It was on C-SPAN. He was the former um, president of the American Psychological Society. And he said he had done a study um, of, of how uh, the Russians uh, operated or could operate, how Facebook operated or could operate on changing the results of an election. Uh, one way, just one way, there are many ways, but one way, and, and this was really extraordinary. He said they could have, in, in his analysis, a huge effect on an election by sending a go to the polls and vote message, okay, to a certain list, a list, say, of Republicans, and, you know, day before our election day, go to the polls and vote. And nobody would know that they didn't send it to the Democrats, just the Republicans, <laughs> or it was subset, right? right? And it does motivate people to go to the <clears throat> polls and vote. Well, if you motivate one group and they go to the polls and vote, you are effectively changing who goes there um, by a certain margin, by a certain percent. He was talking about a differentiation of like 10 million people. Um, and I don't know if I believe this guy it was in the Senate. And Ted Cruz is not credible for me. Yeah. Um, but but it, it is a catchy idea that with a very fine, fine-tuned, almost elegant change in the way you message in, in, uh, in social media, you can change, at least theoretically, and maybe really, you can change the vote. Well, 2016, the Senate report that just broke out, the bipartisan Senate, Senate report, is said the Russians focus strictly or almost exclusively on African-Americans. Yeah. So is that wrong by itself? We haven't come to that. I mean, we can make a rule that says you can't focus only on African-Americans. We can make a well, rule that says you, you can... can make a rule that foreign powers shall not... Oh, of course. <laughs> you know. No, but what about Facebook? Yeah. Uh, if they go only to Democrats and say, go, go vote, and not Republicans, is that, can that be against the law? What I'm saying is that we don't really fully understand the mass psychology. Well, we have the, the FCC rules have not caught up with television yeah. and radio or social media. Yeah. And come on, let's face it, a lot of Americans get their news from Facebook, yeah. Yeah. from all these other social media sources. Um, where's the FCC rulings on, on that as, an, oh. as entities? We need They're to not catch there up. We'll never there catch yet. up by yeah. 2020. No, it's, it's not enough time. Yeah. Uh, speaking of time, we're out of time. Of course. Um, but I wanted to ask you what you think uh, we should be looking for next week. More obstruction. More, <laughs> more name calling. More, um, we'll, we'll see who shows up at some of these subpoenas. We'll see if some of these records get, you know, finally transferred over. We'll see if there's any court decisions on, you know, the efforts to block yeah. subpoenas. Yeah, I remember there's an awful lot of litigation pending. Yeah. We'll see if a more lot of stuff in the pipeline. Yeah. We'll see if more whistleblowers come out from other parts of, uh, you know, Department of Justice or maybe the State Department. Um, more unknown things like that. Things yeah. that uh, will, will, you know, fill the airwaves and then we'll soon forget it because there's just so much. Well, on that point, I would offer my thought. I think next week we're going to see more distraction. This isn't necessarily going to be in Syria, because I don't think, you know, Syria is a good thing for him. Um, but somewhere else, something else, somewhere, some other place. Uh, this is a reality show, and uh, he wants to keep us hopping. He wants to keep populating those first 20 articles in all the papers. And we'll see more distractions from, a, you know, a, a 
foreign policy point of view. That's my prediction. All right. All right. We'll see. Thank you, Tim. Trump week. Thank you, Jay. Aloha, Aloha to you.